Uh, before you start the video, I needed to add this little part. Originally, I was playing the music to this song. And, um, you know, I talk about the song, play, you know, a little bit of music, talk about it, play a little bit of music, talk about it later in the video. And unfortunately, the, uh, the copyright owner of this song obviously, you know, has the thing set up with YouTube where you cannot play this music whatsoever. So YouTube, and of course, it's no fault of theirs. They sent me, and it was HW or something, was the um, the office that holds the rights to this music. They're the ones that are making me pull the music off. So I had to go back in and re-edit the video and pull all the music out. Now, the video was not dependent upon the music. It is still, in its entirety, exactly what it is. Had I known they were going to pull it down, I would have taken a different approach. But you never know these things until you shoot it. So... Even without the music, the entire point of the video is still there. So I hope you do watch it. And if you enjoy it, please, you know, like the video so we can get it out to other people. And if you like what I do, please subscribe to the channel and enjoy the video. There are two songs that are so iconic that they literally only need one chord for you to know what they are. And of course, one of those songs being by Elton John, Benny in the Jets. That is right. That is all it takes for everyone to know exactly what that song is. I remember seeing Elton John years ago in concert, and I saw the same thing on a video here on YouTube. And when I saw him in the concert, he went up to the piano, and, uh, and actually he was playing a digital piano, not too dissimilar from this, and he sat down, went to the piano, sat down, did that, and then looked out into the audience, and the crowd went crazy, because everybody knew exactly what that was. And I saw him do the same exact thing on YouTube. It was a much bigger venue than what it was here, and he was sitting at a grand piano for that one. And he walked up, sat at the grand piano, and then once again, hit that G major seven, and the crowd went ballistic because everybody knew what was coming next. And of course, that is, like I said, Benny and the Jets. But it just so happens there's another song that is equally as iconic that it literally only takes the opening chord for you to know exactly what that is. And of course, that other song is this. And as soon as that opening chord is hit, you know exactly what it is. This is a song that I've been gigging with my band for, Lord, as long as I can remember. And every time we go to do the song, when I step up and play that opening chord, everybody instantly stops what they're doing and turns around because they know what is coming next. Of course, Prince's Purple Rain has become unbelievably iconic. And it is the title track for the album, as well as the movie, both, of course, titled Purple Rain. Now, it's kind of hard to understand exactly what Prince is talking about during the song, because the lyrics can seem kind of confusing at times. And believe it or not, there's not a tremendous amount of information out there about this song. The song appears to be written about love and loss and hope. And the song is a mixture of R&B and blues, rock and gospel with a bit of orchestration. Now, originally, according to the myth, according to the story, and I got to admit, I got a little bit of a problem believing this, that the song was originally written for Stevie Nicks. It was a 10 minute track that had a very country vibe to it. And Prince wanted Stevie Nicks to sing the lyrics and come up with the melody. He sent the track over to her in which she had it for several weeks, at which that point she sent it back to him with the reason of it was just too daunting, it was too hard, that she was not up to the task of writing it and did not feel she could do the song justice. Now, I have to admit, I kind of had a hard time believing that. Stevie Nicks, as we all know, is quite the songstress. I mean, this girl has pinned numerous, numerous hits for Fleetwood Mac as well as for her solo career and numerous number one hits. Stevie Nicks, when people think of great songwriters, they always say 
Paul McCartney and people like him, you know, these, these iconic people that were in these massively big bands. But people never seem to think of Stevie Nicks, who actually is quite the songstress. And I could easily put her in the list of the Billy Joels of the world, the Bob Dylans of the world, the Paul McCartneys of the world. I could easily add Stevie Nicks into that list because she is an amazing songwriter. So I find it kind of hard to believe that Prince could write something that Stevie Nicks would feel that it was just too big of a job and could not handle, being that she is an amazing songwriter. Regardless if that story is true or not, and it's kind of hard to determine because when I was researching this story out, I could find just as many things on the internet that said it happened, but I could find equally just as many things on the internet that said we're not sure if this actually happened or not. And who knows if the quotes that she made saying that it was just too big of a song, who knows if that was made up or not. But regardless of the situation of why Stevie Nicks ultimately felt like she could not finish the song, it was returned back to Prince and not wanting the song to die. Prince actually gave the song to his band at that point, which would be the revolution. He gave the song to them and said, you know what, before we leave here today, Let's rework this song. Let's see what we can come up with and see if we can make this song into something. So the band grueled away in the studio for six, seven, eight hours working on this one particular song. And luckily for Prince, there was one person in that band, the guitarist, Wendy Melvoin, who had worked this song, who ultimately came up with that iconic sound and that iconic chord that opens the song. After they laid everything down for Prince to listen to, he loved what he heard. So he took the song and reworked it, reformulated it into what it is today. Now, the song was not tracked in the studio. The song was actually tracked for the first time live in the First Avenue Club in Minneapolis, which just so happened to be Wendy Melvoin's first show with Prince and the Revolution. At that point, after it was tracked, Prince took all those tracks back to the studio and then reworked and relayed multiple tracks to make the song the song that we hear today. So it's pretty interesting that it was never actually tracked for the first time in a studio like probably 99.9% .9 of the songs in the world are. It was actually tracked live in a club with a band that it was their first time playing with Prince. <laughs> I find that very fascinating to take that approach. Now, once the song was completed, and this is another one of those stories, probably is true, but sometimes I just have a hard time swallowing some of this. At this point, Prince took the packaged song of Purple Rain, completed, tracked, recorded, and sent it over to Jonathan Kane of Journey. In Fears, that Purple Rain sounded a lot like Faithfully. Now, personally, I cannot hear any similarity whatsoever. So again, I kind of have a hard time swallowing this story. Prince being a master musician, obviously he can hear the songs sound nothing alike. And to further add to that claim, when he sent the song over to Jonathan Cain, the comment was Jonathan Cain replied back to Prince, sent him the song back, and he said, you're good, dude. The songs literally sound nothing alike. You're good to go. And apparently he had said that he appreciated Prince sending it over to him just in fear that he didn't, Prince didn't want Jonathan Cain to think he was ripping off his music or to have any type of copyright issues in the future. And I understand, you know, Prince wanting to do that if this actually did happen. And that's, you know, pretty stand up of the guy. But there again, with Prince's ear for music, his amazing, his amazing songwriting abilities and his amazing musicianship, I'm not exactly sure how he would think the songs sounded similar to each other. Now, this is one of the ones that really kind of boggles me. Because like I said, the songs are shockingly dissimilar. With the fact that Faithfully is actually written in the key of B major and Purple Rain is written in B major flat major. Now, granted, the keys are very close. They're a semitone apart. But a semitone is a massive difference. And to give you an example, here, so you can hear the two back to back, 
And then you can decide for yourself if, you know, this is a true story or not. But I'm going to play the intro to Journeys Faithfully, and then right behind it, I will play the intro to Purple Rain on piano. But take a listen to Faithfully real quick. To me, that literally sounds nothing like Purple Rain. (laughs) So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a little bit of Purple Rain, and I'm going to play it more the version that when uh, in the movie of Purple Rain, when he's digging through all of his dad's music, and then he comes across the score, which just in the movie happens to be this song, Purple Rain. So I'm going to play it here on the piano so you can hear the difference. And I really don't hear a similarity between the two. Um, mechanically, they're not even close to each other. So this goes back to, is this story real? Did this really happen? Or is this just a myth? And of course, we don't know. And I promise, given the chance to ever meet Jonathan Cain, I'm going to ask him. <laughs> but we'll have to see how that happens, how that pans out further down the road in the future. But regardless, again, if that happened or not, Purple Rain simply is an amazing song. The album was released in June of 1984. Now, the album Purple Rain did hit number one on the charts. But the song, the the single, never did hit number one. It was held up by a, a duo group, a little pop group named Wham. And the song that kept Purple Rain out of the number one spot just happens to be Wake Me Up Before You Go Go. Now, personally, I think Purple Rain is a much better song than Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go, but I understand the popularity of Wham's Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go. It is a very catchy, very happy, very feel-good song. So I understand the popularity of it and the fact that it did hit number one on the charts. But I still find it amazing that it was strong enough to keep Purple Rain, one of the most iconic songs in the world, out of the number one spot. Now, like I said, the lyrics on this are very confusing, and we're never really sure who he's talking about in the verses, who he's referencing. It could be his family. It could be his band. It could be his lost love, Vanity, who was actually scripted to play in the movie Purple Rain opposite of Prince's character, The Kid, which ultimately the role was giving to Apollonia because of uh, some disagreements between Prince and Vanity, they ended up splitting up, which left the slot open, and then in stepped one Apollonia. But we're not really sure who he's talking about. And like I said, the song is about hope, love, and loss, which is evident in the lyrics. But we're really not sure who he's referring to when he sings. Now, when we play the first verse here in a minute, listen to that opening iconic chord. First off, the sound, which is just fantastic. Um, You can hear the chorus in it, the clean tone. Obviously played on a Fender-style, out-of-phase guitar pickup selection, I would assume. That's what it sounds like to me. But what makes it interesting is the song, you know, when you watch any of the videos or anything or look at the music, the song's actually in B-flat. But the opening chord is actually a B-flat suspended second, which is this. But what makes the song sound so unique on the opening chord... It is a B-flat suspended second, but what Wendy Melvoin, what she did when they were reworking the song is she put a D on top of that chord, an open D, and that's what gives it that iconic sound. So what she's actually playing is this. That is quite a stretch on a piano, by the way, that's over an octave. (laughs) But what makes it sound so good is that D on the bottom that is contrasting against that C, which is the normal third note in a B-flat major. 
So let's play the opening verse and the first chorus. And you'll see what I'm talking about when I say the lyrics are confusing because there's just not a tremendous amount of information out there on why Prince wrote this song. Is he talking about things in his personal life or were these words just simply written for the character of the kid in the movie Purple Rain? Now, just from the lyrics, we can assume that this has something to do with somebody besides his girlfriend, Vanity. That was the girlfriend before all this took place, like I said. Because the second verse actually sounds like it was literally written for a past love. It comes out, I never wanted to be your weekend lover. I only wanted to be some kind of friend. Baby, I could never steal you from another. It's such a shame our friendship had to end. Now there again, that sounds like that could have been written for Vanity uh, vanity at that time. You know, his lost lover, like I said. But it also very well could have just been scripted for the part of the kid in the movie Purple Rain, where his love interest becomes Apollonia, who of course has this thing going back and forth between the kid in the movie and Morse Day's character in the movie, how she's going back and forth. So it could be that he's just simply referencing that, and people are reading into it a little more than what it actually is, because Prince is never really clear about those topics. If, if it is actually written about the people in his family or love interest, or if it was just simply written for the movie, and everybody's just kind of taking shots. Well, maybe it's about this. Maybe it's about that. Listen to the second verse. You'll understand what I'm talking about because it goes after the verse. It goes back into the course, and then it ends up with, I only want to see you underneath the proper rain. Because ultimately, what this song actually is about, it's about Armageddon. It's about the end of days, the end of time. But listen to the second verse, and you'll see what I'm talking about. And we can only assume that he's referencing an ex-lover, which in this case would have been Vanity, if it's about his personal life. Now, you can hear there, we can only assume that he's talking about Vanity at this point. Um, I never wanted to be your weekend lover. I only wanted to be some kind of friend. Maybe I can never steal you from another, but it's such a shame our friendship had to end. So I can only assume that we're talking about vanity at this point, which apparently at one point in his life was very important, was a very important love interest. Then it ends up, I only want to see you underneath the purple rain. But what is purple rain? Why is it called purple rain? Where is this coming from? I mean, it's such an odd grouping of words, purple rain. Well, there's a couple of little stories out about that also. If you ask Wendy Melvoin, who ultimately was the strong voice in this song with the way the song sounds and the formulation of the song, according to her, purple is the color of morning. When you get up in the morning, the sky's purple. And the rain is a cleansing effect, washes everything clean. It's starting new, basically. And when she was asked, she said, it's what purple rain is. It's a fresh start. It's starting new. It's starting over. And I guess I kind of understand the reasoning behind that. But when Prince was asked, he said it was pretty much about the end of days. And that one, I believe, just as well. Because they both have their own opinion on what the song means. Because to them, the song obviously means different things. And many songs that we hear... I can hear a song, you can hear the same song, and to us they will have different meanings because we will relate them to different scenarios in our lives because ultimately that's what music does. But to Prince, this song was about the end of days. It was about, like I said, Armageddon. And it's not the morbidity of Prince. It's not that at all. According to Prince, this is about being with the one you love and when the time comes, having strength, and faith in God, and following your belief. And I like that. I, I really like that. That is, that, that's to me, that's kind of a refreshing sentiment. You know, with everything that's going on in the world today, and everybody's political views, and, you know, music is just, let's be honest, there's a lot of bad music being pumped out right now from all directions, from, you know, corporate cookie-cutter America. But for him to come out and write this song which is very passionate, and you can hear it when he's singing. He's incredibly passionate about the vocal lines in this song and the way he sings it. But to come out and say this song is about, you know, it is about hope, love, and loss, what everybody says it's about, because the hope is for a better tomorrow. The love is the, you know, the love of your life, the person you're with, and the loss is, well, obviously the end of days, Armageddon. But I kind of like the sentiment about that. 
that even when everything's at its worst, an end of days could be, you know, the end of the world, or it could just simply be another chapter in your life. You know, you're closing the book on that. That no matter how bad things are in your life, love the people that love you. Tell them that you love them. Have faith in them. And have faith in God. And everything will be okay. And I like that message. That's a good message. How Prince came up with Purple Rain, and he was asked this, why Purple Rain? What what does this mean? He said, well, when there's war in the sky, the sky becomes red. Take the blue from the sky. Red and blue make purple. And then, of course, with the rains, purple rain. Cleaning everything off. A purple sky, the rain, cleansing the world, I guess, of everything that's gone bad. And that's actually not a bad sentiment if you think about it. So let's listen to the last verse on this. Because I think the last verse kind of drives this point home where he says, Honey, I know, I know times are changing. It's time we all reach out for something new, and that means you too. Um, and I can only assume that he's referencing, you know, things are coming to an end here. Then he says, You say you want a leader. Somebody to follow, somebody to believe in, somebody to guide you, but you can't seem to make up your mind. And if I'm reading into this correctly, this is absolutely brilliant writing because that's where people are in the world today. People can't make up their mind about anything. Do I believe in this? Do I believe in that? Do I follow this person? Do I follow that person? They can't make up their mind. So what he's saying is, I think you better close your mind. Quit thinking about it and just let me guide you. Let me guide you through the purple rain. Let me guide you through the end of times. Let me get you to the other side. And that's perfect. That's beautiful. And if this is how he saw the end of the world, I hope we all see the end of the world this way. That, you know, it's things are coming to a close and this is it. But there, but life goes on. And I'm with the people I love. They know I love them. So no matter what happens, everything's going to be okay. And that is beautiful. And if that's what this actually means, that is brilliant. But let's listen to the final verse of this. But before we do, one thing I want to mention real quick, I've never been a big fan of fuzz boxes on guitars. They're overly saturated. They're incredibly distorted. And normally when I hear that, I'm like, oh, dude, that's a production error. But in this song, it actually works. And it works fantastically. (laughs) And I couldn't imagine any other sound in this. So before we get to the third verse, listen to the second verse where he comes in with the the over, the crazy, heavily distorted guitars. And listen how this comes in and how well it works. Even with all the mud and noise, it works flawlessly. I love that. (laughs) It is so muddy. It is so saturated. There's no definition to it at all but it works perfectly in this song. And to me, that just adds to Prince Prince's brilliance of the music. If I heard that tone in any other song, I'd be like, oh, that's horrible. That's terrible. But it works beautifully in Purple Rain. And I just wanted to get that out of the way because I thought that was very interesting that he added an incredibly oversaturated fuzz box on that guitar with all the noise, all the mud. And it was brilliant. So moving on, let's finish this off with the third verse here. And listen to what I'm talking about when I, you know, because like I said, ultimately this song is about Armageddon and the end of the world. But listen, listen to what he says here and you can hear it and you understand what he's saying. And you have to admit, if anybody ever gave 100% of themselves singing a song, it is this song. (laughs) I mean, this guy is so on point vocally on this and you can hear the power and the passion of what he's saying. Now, there again, you know, how much of this was actually done for the movie, for the character, the kid in the movie, when he's singing it to Apollonia? Or how much of this did he actually pull from his real life and in his faith in God and his envisioning the end of the world, which he obviously had some kind of obsession with because that was very evident in the album before this, when he did the song 1999, he literally says, we're going to party like it's 1999 the last days on earth. And I don't know if you guys were, I'm assuming, you know, most of you were alive back then, but that was the big thing back then is, you know, the world's going to end on 2000, the world's going to end. So let's party like it's 1999. But it's also that song where he first references the color purple, where he says the sky was all purple and there were people running everywhere. 
And so obviously there is some type of obsession or some type of curiosity about the end of times because he mentions it in 1999, which literally he wrote a whole song about it. And then it comes back all these years later with Purple Rain, which is, according to Prince, it's about the end of times. It's about Armageddon. So there's obviously some kind of fascination there with Purple Rain and the end of times. Now, since its release, Prince has played Purple Rain in every single show, except when he changed his name to Symbol. And when he changed his name to Symbol, he left all the old music behind simply because it was something different, something new, a new start. It was his Purple Rain. You know, that that world had ended. He was on to a new world. So he was leaving everything behind, washed away by the Purple Rain. And fortunately for us, that only lasted a couple of years. And then he came back to be Prince. And love him or hate him, you cannot deny the brilliance that is Prince. And you absolutely cannot deny the musicianship that is Prince. He had a band that helped him record all this music, which he simply could have done by himself. He could have went into a studio and laid every single track to every single instrument himself and made it work flawlessly. Granted, he would not have had the input from a Wendy Melvoin, which ultimately gave the song the sound that it is. The sound that we love, which is Purple Rain. Now, Purple Rain is such an extremely important song. And you're probably thinking, well, how? How is that possible? How is it possible? Purple Rain is so important that it is actually in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. 500 songs that changed and shaped music. And I believe that because we got a whole different glimpse of, you know, when you come off of 1999 into Purple Rain, and let's be honest, the entire album of Purple Rain is absolutely brilliant. Um, When Doves Cry, The Beautiful Ones, which just happens to be one of my favorite songs on the album, of course, besides Purple Rain. And Purple Rain is a very important song to me, and I played it every single show. And it's actually the song that after I got through singing it, before the guitar solo, my band went down to half volume and actually proposed to my wife on the stage at a club during this song. And like any good musician would do, after I went down, she said, yes, we kissed. I ran back up on stage and finished the guitar solo (laughs) because that's what good musicians do. The song comes first. It's all about the show. So (laughs) with that little tidbit of information, but Prince has played this, like I said, under the moniker of Prince at every single show. And he played it in 2007 at the Super Bowl halftime show, which with out a doubt, is literally the best halftime show ever to have graced the NFL. And what makes this so special and what makes it just such an event is, of course, he closed out with Purple Rain, one of his biggest songs ever. And while they were doing Purple Rain, they turned all the lights off in the entire stadium and everything was purple. All the lights that were on were purple which was an awesome sight and unfortunately something I did not get to see live because I would love to have been there for that. But right when he started the guitar solo, it physically started to rain. And he was playing Purple Rain in a stadium of Purple Rain. And like I said, Prince continued to play Purple Rain. And unfortunately, Purple Rain was the last song Prince ever played in his life. Now, Prince's last show was in Atlanta, April 14, 2016. And the final set was The Beautiful Ones, Diamonds and Pearls, and Purple Rain, which, of course, Purple Rain closed out the show. And unfortunately, that would be the last song Prince would ever play. Prince died April 21st, 2016, one week later. And the world is just a little sadder place without Prince. 